a look at the new article on LiriaHub.com. If you don't know the site, you should definitely check it out. Um, this one is about six keys to a good deck. And it just came out today. So Lirio had a um, Gwent Pro tutorial series where he talked about um, some of the advanced concepts in Gwent, including um, things like uh, tutoring and, and, and the math of that and thinning and rule of 16 and uh, lots of other topics that are worth checking out. Um, they're all here at this uh, URL that I'll put in the description. But um, you can see... And he, he did a, a series of each of the leader abilities. Um, he's got he's got final round weight of cards, weight of cards in Gwent, Bulldozer Strategy. I remember Bulldozer Strategy. It's like, for example, the Golden Necker uh, Relic deck uh, employed that strategy very well. Um, but yeah, so this one is about how to build a good deck. So... And Puzzle Express apparently wrote, hey, what makes a good deck? Really? I didn't know that. Oh, on Novigrad Journal. Cool. Uh, I will check that out too. I miss you, Puzzle. You see this? Come say hi. Um, okay, so six key aspects to a good deck. He says, one is points. Two is control. Three is evasion. Effective value removed from opponent's cards by avoiding certain interactions. So this, I guess, would be, for example, not giving, like, when your opponent hasn't played their um, Dorigary, not giving them a great lock target or whatever, right? Or um, not giving Nilfgaard good assimilate targets until you've seen their Archog get played. So it's kind of, usually it comes at some sort of cost to you, but it, in theory, it costs your opponent more. Like, you get five less points, but they get ten less points, right? And then consistency. So some of you may remember that um, if you watch my stream, you may have heard me talk about the requirements for an archetype to be competitive in Gwent. Uh, I haven't, I hadn't like put put it down writing with nearly as much rigor as as Lyria has, but sort of in conversation, what I always say is for an archetype to be competitive and viable in Gwent, it needs to have uh, points, control, and con and consistency. I never really thought about uh, evasion, but. Yeah, this makes a lot of sense. This is like utility, right? And so like I've always said things like dwarves are never going to be a real archetype because they don't have proper control. I mean, they do have some control, but like vampires can't kill anything, right? They can only just bleed stuff down. Um, or at certain points, like they didn't have enough points, right? Uh, like Mill may have evasion and control and even consistency, but usually lacks points. Uh, the, the best decks have all four of these, I think. Kind of guys have universal for most card games. Points control, evasion, and consistency are commonly present in mainstream mana-based one-round card games. Interesting. Uh, a special part in those is often played by the tempo aspect of points. Aggro decks are popular in games like Magic or Hearthstone and have no real an uh, analog in Gwent. These games uh, is, are aggro decks, decks where you like go for face and try to kill the opponent before they have a chance to get going. I guess it would be like Siege in Gwent, but that's only for one round. It doesn't apply for the whole game, right? The closest match would be aggressive Gwent decks with a strategy of yeah, aiming at a 2-0. Oh, yeah. But they have a different feeling. Due to the split into at least two rounds, a defender is in a better position than in a mana-based game. Yes. Uh, I don't know what any of that stuff means because I don't play Hearthstone, but... Five. Okay, there's actually a... Uh, right. One moment. Okay. Uh, spreadability. Gwent is about winning two rounds out of three. Consequently, a good deck must be able to spread its power into at least two rounds. Um, in like the... Like, I remember reading Aratusa Academy when I started playing Gwent. And one of the articles they had there was like, Oh, a common beginner mistake is uh, making a deck with a really cool combo. And their whole deck is dedicated to pulling that combo off. But that only is going to win them one round. How do they win the other round? I remember I had a Kiki Queen deck, uh, and 
the round where I played Kiki Queen was great, but sometimes like they would bleed me and I'd have to be forced to play Kiki Queen and then I'd lose round three or um, I didn't have a, you know, uh, or like I would play Kiki Queen to win round one and then uh, and I, I was just kind of stuck. Like I was like, oh man, if only I had my Kiki Queen uh, now again. So I, try, I made a deck with Renew, where I would renew my Kiki Queen. Uh, and like I remember playing against Trident in one of his viewer battles and kind of like debated him into playing it because like I beat him and I was like, yeah, try that. And then Trident tried it. And after a bunch of like different tweaks, he's like, yeah, the more I play this, the more frustrated I am because it's not a good deck. But uh, this is a common mistake that a lot of people make. Uh, and so I think this is a, a good call out here. In testing exactly two rounds is economically the most effective allocation of resources, but it limits the ability to actively interfere with the opponent's plans. This characters would deck with low consistency, weak bronze package, which would pass round one soon and invest power round two, three. Um, strong round three game plan with second say, deck invest power in round one and round three. Okay. So if you have a deck that wants to like, I would say... Kashi is, well, maybe not. Uh, we'll, we'll see how Lyric categorizes it, but um, what's a good example of this? Vampires, right? Ren free vampires. They, 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 they generally were happy with the long round three, uh, and they would try to win round one to ensure that they get last say because um, Regis, right? Regis Gluttony, not having that get tall punished. Uh, another, I think a good example of this one might be Warrior's Devotion. I, don't, I wouldn't call it a weak bronze package, but they do need some time to get their stuff going and they have veterans and they have uh, uh, tier, which is only um, active uh, in its most powerful form once they've won around. So, okay, active decks are capable of contesting each round and adapt to the given matchup. Um, there's also a type of pure carryover like Imagawa Machines, where round one is sacrificed or develop max carryover. Such decks allocate power in round two and round three. Okay. Um, a deck with perfectly spreadable power is able to invest just enough resources in each round to achieve necessary objectives. I would say maybe like Renfrey and G might be one of these. Because like, yes, there's Triss, but other than that, like they have Blightmakers and they have Renfrey's Gang and they have like engines like, um, you know, Light Cav or, or Marines or whatever that are good in medium, long, short, kind of, you know, and they have ways to control their opponents. So... It's kind of a very adaptable deck. It's what I would play if I was trying to climb from rank five. A weakly spreadable deck struggles to play more than one round and often is forced to overcommit. Yeah. Like, let's say you have Madame. Oh, Passive Floor is a great example of this, right? Or if you were playing Siege without Hensel. Like, you, you, you'd you be like forced to play Siege to win a round, but the other round, how do you win it, right? Scaling. Ideally, the deck is always able to force any of my decks release at CV Dub. Uh, the deck, uh, so scaling. Ideally, the deck is always able to force the beneficial round length. In reality, there is competition with the opposing deck to reach the most favorable position, especially in the latter setting with random coin. Getting optimal round length in every game is unreal. The word scaling is commonly used in a long round contest between two decks where one of them outpoints or outscales opponent due to more points gained with round length. Okay, so scaling is like um, Marines, right? Once their target is on top of the deck, it's two points per turn. In a three card round, that's, you know, three and six, that's nine points. That's right. But in a nine card round, um, that's 21 points, right? Whereas uh, a card like Wall Hunt Hound, assuming you have dominance the whole time, is one point per turn. So, like w when you see people count, say like, "Hey, I'm getting X per turn," or "I don't have any engines," or whatever, I need to leave the round. 
it's because like if your opponent has even if it's one point of turn if they have engines in round one and you don't and all you have are like point slam or control cards and you can't answer their engines the longer you stay the more likely you are to either have to spend too much to, w to win the round or get out without losing on even or or you might end up losing on even or just like spending a lot and not winning the round like all those things are bad uh outcomes that tend to result from committing to a position where you have inferior scaling committing to a long long round one when you have infinite uh, uh inferior scaling so that that's very cool he's putting a, a pretty nice theoretical framework around all this stuff at least for me some of this is new i don't know how new it is for everybody else um, a deck which scales well is is strong in short, four card, mid length, and long round. Okay, is only the deck scaling badly is strong only in long and short rounds. Okay. Hmm. So my mentor's deck um, is good, I think, in medium. It's at its best in its medium length round. Uh, it's weak and short, and depending on the matchup, it's also strong in long round, but it's, it's definitely weak and short. So it's not a deck that scales perfectly, it's a deck that scales badly, or at least two out of three, I don't know. So those are the six keys to recap. Number one is points, number two is control, number three is evasion, four is consistency, Five is spreadability, and six is scaling. I'm trying to make sure I understand the difference between scaling and... Like, why does he say this deck scales well in short? It, the deck which scales well is strong in short cards, mid-length, and long rounds. Okay, so so he's not using scaling to mean good like a deck that scales well. What I would have expected scaling to mean is that it's just in the longest in, in the long round it scales the best, right? Like I would have thought like cultists are the best scaling. Um, but he's saying it scales well, as in it scales well across different round lengths, or it deals with different round lengths well, whereas. Can spreadability means that okay take my Igor Townsfolk deck right um like it's got coin generators coin spenders and then it's got like feedback loops right so if you have um a scribe and you have something that can spawn units that's you're spending coin, getting points, and then getting coins back, right? Or if you're playing Shady Vendor with King of Beggars in deck, you're spending points, getting you're spending coins, getting points, and then getting coins back. Um, that gives you power. But like in my in my Igor Townsfolk deck, I need to do some setup before that's the case. And unless I have Sesame's in my graveyard, I have a bad short round. So having round control is really important, not because it's necessarily bad, short, medium, or long, but it's more that like it doesn't spread well. So if, I, if I'm if i forced to commit my Igor and then opponent passes, or I'm forced to commit my Novograd in round one and then opponent like passes, I'm kind of forced into bleeding and I'll be in a round two where I have one less card than them. So I got to make up for that, right? It doesn't spread well because some of my cards are like very chunky in terms of the portion of power they represent from my whole deck. So I would say like a vampire's deck is similar, right? The bronzes spread well, right? And flatters are like kind of power spikes, but you have Oriana in, in my Renfrey Vamps deck. Oriana is like one thing that like can help you win up a round, a contested round, and Regis is another. And there isn't like, when you commit Oriana, you're either gonna like win by a lot, <laughs> or 
You, like, opponents should usually pass or answer it and answer with something big, right? So if you're from blue coin and an opponent hasn't committed anything and you commit Oriana to get them to pass, well, you kind of have to bleed because your long round three is no longer there because you no longer have Oriana, right? Unless you have like both letters and, uh, you know, maybe like a debt laugh or something, then maybe your long round three is fine. But if you don't, then yeah. Is there even a third round in Gwen? So that's, that's spreadability, is like being able to split your power into chunks that correspond to the length of the round at hand and how easy it is for you to do that. Okay. And then if you don't know, points are just either cards that play for a lot of points, uh, cards that gain points per turn, also known as engines, or like sort of set up payoff cards. So that this example would be Play open sesame and then uh, play something that can spend coins. That's set up and pay off, right? Or play alumni. Uh, sorry, ban art students and then play alumni. Or uh, apply a bunch of bleeds and then play proto letter. Like a finisher, right? A one two. Okay, and then uh, control damage, tall punish, white punish, lock, banish, graver. All these are control. Okay. So those are the six characteristics of good decks. Um, so now he's going to go into more detail on each of the, the sections. So points, uh, if it's something average point output of meta decks, then only a deck with potential to equal or exceed such output is competitive. As in the cards level, only a deck where crucial cards play on or above the power versus provision group are competitive. A greedy combo deck which has 10% chance to outpoint a meta deck is better than a consistent deck where every card plays slightly below the curve in every game. Such a deck has no win con. Win condition is a scenario in which deck A outpoints deck B. Okay, so this is... Like, this was something that I struggled with for a long time. Because I would I would see, like, a meta deck. I'd, I'd grab one of Lyria's decks, um, and I'd be like... And I'd, and I'd play some games, and one game I would just miss Golden Necker or miss some Crucial Clark and just lose. Or run into a Cultist, and I'm like, I can't deal with this, and I just lose. And then I would try to adjust the deck so that it's more consistent. Or it can beat those, like, decks that I was having trouble with. But what would happen is, sure, I never outright lose, but then even when I have everything, I would still have like 10% or 20% less points, which meant that like against a lot of competitive decks, when we both get our cards, I would lose. Um, so he's saying, Lirio says, it's better to play a more greedy deck that has a 10% chance to outpoint like a strong deck a meta deck than to play a deck where you're 100% likely to achieve your power, but that 100% of your power is still less than the average meta deck. Because <clears throat> there's no there's no prize for losing by one point in Gwent, right? If you lose, you lose and you get nothing. You get nothing. Alright, so control. One of the common scripts says that control could win games. Such a bit is not beneficial in Gwent. Control should rather be as Right, because there's no face. Like, you can't attack the opponent's, like, base with your control, right? All you can do is ha remove their points from their board. That's all control can do. Um, or remove cards from their deck or cards from their giga. But essentially, all those things are, like, a, a stepping stone to, to making your opponent have less points. But you still need points in Gwent. A control, in a control tool, count on the opponent's card and outputs more points than such a card, we trade up. So an example of this would be if I play um, a Disciple, uh, a, a Syndicate, right? So it comes down as three, I click it, and I have a three and a two. And if the opponent then plays a Dancing Star, which does three, two damage, and his Maddox comes out, right? So now he did five damage to me, and he got three points on his board, that's eight. And he, he removed five from me. So he traded up by three, right? Now... Usually in Gwent, when we say uh, it's trading well, trading up, whatever, um, there's also the whole provision cost thing, right? Like, because 
most decks have roughly 165 provisions, give or take, you know, one, two, or three. And if I'm spending a 10 provision card to counter your four provision card, well, that itself it may not be a mistake, but eventually if I keep doing that over and over again, I'm going to run out of like, like I'm going to lose that game, right? Because eventually the opponent will have high provision cards left and I won't have any and yeah. Control tools trading now should be used with caution. Sometimes they are necessary to limit opponent's greed, but then in order to win, other cards have to make up the points. So this is like, if I use a parasite to kill your bloody good friends, right? Because bloody good friends, or, or like to kill your brawler. Your brawler is four power. I use a parasite. It's a six provision card. It's trading down or, or maybe I, I use it to kill a disciple. So you still got the little token, but the disciple has gone. That's trading down, right? I damage your three power engine, but you still have two points and I have nothing. And I use the higher provision card. And when you do that, uh, you're basically, it's like taking out a loan. You have a debt. Without control, every game of Gwent is won by the greedy deck. Control is a measure of a deck's ability to mess up the opponent's game plan. Okay. Evasion comes after points in control. Just like control, the usefulness of evasion depends on the matchup. It could be a spontaneous, uh, it could be spontaneous and come from character of the used archetype. For example, classical swar would naturally avoid tall punish. Right. So yeah, if you're going wide, you're evading tall punish. So like that's power that you have that isn't measured or reflected in the points on the board, but it is an advantage of your deck, right? Or if you have a deck that thins, uh, if you have a deck that clogs your opponent, um, and your opponent is playing compass, then you know you're, you're you're controlling his game plan, right? But uh, if if you're playing mill and your opponent uses compass to play lippy, that's him evading, I think, not letting your mill do anything. Um, other examples would be like, you know, uh, not giving units against a spell blood deck or something. Thanks for the follow, Leo. Welcome to the stream. You need people like me. Oh, Teal, Leo sorry. underscore Gustin just followed. A deck may be tuned to improve evasion, which always could come with points straight up. So in like a crimes deck, um, like this one. Let's say I were to remove a townsfolk and add in um, uh, Sir, Sir Skewersworth, right? Because this has immunity, it can't really be controlled directly, right? And it's like a passive engine that every time I play crime, it gains points. That could be one way for me to increase my deck's evasion. Many evasion ideas are collective. In order to evade tall punish, none of the important units could go tall. To avoid wide punish, none could go wide. To avoid damage as many plays as possible must be uninteractive. Yeah. There's lots of different ways to be ev ev evasive. It's impossible to build decks all concentrate on evasion, but its value must be really huge to make up for the points deficit. Back in the day of early homecoming, no unit decks, there was no limit of no unit, but uh, of the number of units at the time. Or immune slizzard with Aridin. Um, etc. In Gwentfinity, the opportunities for evasion focus decks are weaker, also because proactive point output is much higher. Yeah, part of how like evasive decks work, think of like my no units uh, death wish deck, right? Like round one, you thin and slam a bunch of points to get your opponent to pass, and then you go into round three, and then you play nothing other than like vile and um, here I'll just show you. Okay, uh, you know that's Deathwish. So, in round three, uh, you play Frightener and you play Vile if you have it. Vile of uh, Forbidden Knowledge. And um, and then you just play a bunch of control cards and remove everything they play. And you don't play any points, so they have nothing to hit, nothing to interact with, nothing to copy, nothing to steal. Uh, and some decks, like, let's say, if you're playing against Blaze of Glory, like, they won't even be able to use their Blood Eagle. If you're playing against Assimilate, Stefan won't be able to hit anything. He'll just spawn eight cards and ditch him into the graveyard. Uh, so, 
It, but it only works because at the end of it all, you play Dead Laugh and consume it twice um, for 18 points and like ruin and consume it a bunch for, for a bunch of points. Uh, and you have Toads in the graveyard that pop out and you have Dagon in the graveyard that pops out. And suddenly you have like 74 points in two turns, right? Because your Frightener will transform and you, you'll click the vial and a million other things. Or or a deck um, with like Hensel, you know, doing everything in the last turn. If you're going, if you're being evasive, you need to have like some sort of big point finisher or some way to get your points. Uh, and no unit traps, that was Eldane, right? Yeah. Consistency. Uh, I think cons consistency should be pretty obvious what it is, but like you can get pretty advanced with this. Um, But it's basically about how likely you are to have access to the cards that you need to have access to when you need to have access to them. Uh, is a support feature for points, control innovation. It lets potential to be realized more often in practice. Without distinctive points and acceptable control innovation, a high cost would only be consistent at being bad. Uh, the chances to find a single card in a game of Gwent with no thinning are 80% by round three, but only 50% in round one. So if you're playing Madame and your game plan involves playing Madame round one and you don't have a tutor for it, you're clowning because half of your games, you're not going to have your Madame round one. And that's assuming that you don't break anything else. A single tutor of other possibilities to 97% and 75%. So if you have Royal Decree and Madame, you have a 75% chance to have access to Madame round one. So in, my, in, in the deck you see on the left, I really want to play Dagon round one. Um, first of all, I want the first form Dagon because it's the carryover one. And also because uh, I want to... It's a consume. And I really want to play Bruis. Because Dagon Bruis is how I win round one. And so... Um, I have Royal Decree, Whispering Hillock, and Arcane Tome. So in order for me to have access to Bruis, I have one, two, three, four, right? Because like, it's imperative that I have him in round one, um, especially on, on blue coin. And then for Dagon, I have Dagon himself and a Royal Decree. So I have, and Tome, which can play Decree, right? So I have three. So when you see me like getting salty because I don't have access to my Dagon in round one in a deck that has like, he, I have to miss all three cards. This is why. Because even with just Royal Decree and Dagon, um, I should have a 75% chance to get it. And, and if you want to dive more into the probabilities of that, it's here in the tutor section. But um, let's see what Lyra is trying to teach us here. Consistency cards effectively remove raw power potential from the deck. They are justified only when some pieces... Right. So Hillock plays for zero points. Right, so it's I'm paying eight provisions to have to have zero, to no, play no points, but you know the convenience or the 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 payoff of being able to play Bruce in round one is worth me sacrificing eight provisions. This always applies to common decks, no matter the matchup phase. High provision cost of consistent tools used in common decks is a hidden way of keeping them in check. Yeah, like if this stuff was free, if tutors were th were free. That everybody would play disgusting broken combos and there would be no other kind of deck. So this is the likelihood of achieving your your combo, I think. Or achieving your potential, right? Whatever that means for your deck. And then this is the power of your deck. Oh, I see. So he's saying that, like... If you have a deck with no key cards... Then, um... Like, while, you know... Or, like, you don't have any huge key cards. Like, you still have cards that are important. But there's no, like, cards that if you miss, you just lose the game, right? 
Like, if you miss Yago in a Yago deck, you probably lose the game. <laughs> um, so he's saying that, like, your, your, your power is, like, more, sp like, more spread out. As in, um, like, sure, some games you'll have, like, very little power, but, like, even if you're, like, in these ranges, like, you still get some power, right? Um, whereas here, it's like you only get your power when you draw the stuff. I think that's what that means. Over tutoring. Uh, let's see. This applies to combo decks no matter matchup based. Combo deck without consistency tools. Combo deck with consistency tools. Okay, so he's saying like some percentage of the time you'll have very little power and then a lot of the times you'll have like most of your power whereas if you have bad consistency then a lot of times you will have like only 20 percent of your power but then you know most of the time or some of the time you'll have like 80 percent of your power that's what these two mean so Consistency makes it more likely for you to achieve a higher amount of your power. Your max theoretical power. Common decks have two states with a huge power gap, which is if all pieces were found in time or not. Oh, I see. There's no middle ground. Like, either you find your stuff and you play for this for, for like a lot of power, or you don't find them and you play for no power. So it's very important that you increase the likelihood of you drawing your stuff rather than missing your stuff, right? Because there's, there's no in-between. Either you found your Salamandra gold or Golden Necker or whatever, um, and, and you get a lot of points, or you don't and you get nothing. Let's repeat. What does it take to make a Gwent deck well-spreadable? So this is spreadability and scaling. Win less, but more often, versus win by a lot, but not mostly lose. Uh, Holy says he's saying power output is much more highly variable with no tutors, but has a higher overall average. But with tutors, you're more consistent in power. Yeah, I don't know which of my questions you're answering with that, but I think I figured it out eventually. Um. How do you make a Gwent deck well spreadable? Decisive round win condition must be discoupled from the package winning another round. So, take the Araka Swarm Sabbath deck, right? In round one, you play Defender, you play AQ, you play Itter, uh, Stalker, um, you consume the AQ, you make a bunch of Itters, you might even play Hive Mind, but you're not playing Sabbath in round one, right? And you usually don't have like two hitters or three hitters on the board in round one. Um, oh, you might have two, but uh, from blue coin. But you're definitely not playing Busty in round one. You're definitely, uh, n you know, yeah. Those things are usually for round three, where you've opened with Sabbath and you have your engines and you, ge you generate tokens and then you eat those tokens or destroy enemy units or set up Busty. You have Ran Warriors, and then you drop the Glusty and get a lot of points. Okay, sorry about that. It is welcome for the package to support Wincon, but Wincon sh couldn't be indispensable to make the package roll. So, like, maybe you have to play Wincon to win round one, but then you need to have, like, your bronze package for round three or something. Your other package. Spreadability and scaling are closely related in practice. Okay. That's why I was like trying to uh, figure out what how to distinguish between them. A deck scaling badly into a long round must be perfectly spreadable in order to play three rounds actively and shorten round three. Right. So maybe like Lirio's Precision Strike deck. Doesn't have a lot of engine power, just has a lot of points. So that, or possibly Ogroids. That kind of deck 
They don't usually want a very long round three. They want, you know, they want a short round three. A deck should be liking puts in a short round, but outstanding long round must win round one at all costs. So this would be like, uh, my golden decker mentors deck. If that deck gets bled, it's probably gonna lose. So it has to win round one so that it can guarantee that like the round that it chooses to play its win condition at is like at least five cards long. Yeah. Araka Storm Sabbath. There are some things you can do to defend the bleed in that deck, but in general, if you lose round one, you probably lose the game. A deck unable to or like Kelly. <laughs> A deck unable to spread enough resources for round one. Uh, because of their bronzes being inferior to the meta, must scale well into every round length. So, like, warriors or self-wound. Perfect skip, really three-round place. Isn't useful when the deck is unable to push round two. Right, so, if, if, if your points can be spread out and, like, if, if your deck is a mid-range pile, and the cards don't need each other, you don't have any combos, and they play for the same amount of points whether you play them, like, together or separate, your deck is very spreadable. But if you can't, if that deck can't bleed because it's like a reactive deck, um, then you then if your opponent passes early in round one, you have no way to shorten round three without suffering some huge losses. So, like just having a spreadable deck isn't enough if you can't you know, bleed with it. If opponent can just pass, because you can't stop your opponent from losing round one, right? Like, you can't stop an early pass at seven cards. There's nothing you can do about that. Well, you can by, like, tempo passing, but even then, at best, that gets you even. But there's a lot of decks that are fine to lose uneven. For example, uh, Self Wound, Patch of Fury was fine to lose uneven in a lot of matchups when it was meta. And it could just defend the bleed or use it to set up care trolled. Knowing that they always won a long round, they knew that you had to bleed, and they knew that during the bleed they could like force more out of you than they would have to spend. To fully exploit good short round scaling and spreadability, strong proactive plays are needed. Right. Because you need them to bleed. Such plays are always openers in round two push and have good unconditional value in the short round three. So a good example of a card like this would be Jacques. Right? Like now. E if you're Devotion, a lot of times you want to use your Jacques round three, but let's say you're not Devotion, right? If you play Jacques with King of Beggars in deck and it pops out, you have two spenders on the board, plus you got like uh, 12 points and four coins. Like your opponent now has to like deal with 16 points that you have and also the fact that you have two spenders, which means you could drop like Ixora and spend a bunch and kill whatever he plays. So, or... Um, if you have Operator Flutter or Incubus for Flutter, right? Um, it's a proactive play you can open the bleed with. If you don't, if your deck doesn't have that, then you can't bleed. Uh, so if you're playing like Bounty, <laughs> Bounty has a hard time bleeding, or like Blaze of Glory Warriors. Uh, you could play like your bronzes, your bronze uh, like four piece that are. You have a couple of proactive ones, but a lot of your stuff is are reactive, so it's kind of hard for you to push uh, with those with control e decks. To build a deck with good scaling, it is useful to think precisely about cards that you would play in a four, seven, and ten card round length. And the reason I think he keeps going with four, ten, and seven is because a lot of times when you're bleeding, you don't play your last card. Because almost always your opponent saves their biggest two plays for the last two cards. So it's very unlikely that your one card like play is going to beat their two best cards. Which means that you often end up passing and with one card left. And so you draw three more and that goes to four, right? Thing with round one. A lot of times people have one card they're not willing to play in round one. And... and um, that, you know, and then if dry passes happen, uh, you end up in a seven or ten card round three. So it's rare to have like a three card round three. That means something crazy happened or somebody made a mistake. 
thinking about four, we would discover how important proactive high-end plays and polarization are. Well, 10 cards should show us that a decent amount of control tools is often obligatory. Okay, meta. So here's some meta examples um, from February. It says provision and power values of some cards would differ from February because of the March patch. It takes a bit by clicking on the images. So uh, one example he's got here is the Renfri Kashi list. This is actually my deck. Uh, with Iris and Roach and Knickers, Cyclops, Dorgary, Well Hunt Riders, One Damsel. So he says, Kashi combined with Karanthir or Scratch Lot and Force of Nature Leader Ability is the main source of points. Karanthir plus Kashi is a two card combo. Missing any one of those two in time loses loads of points because Karanthir has no other similarly good target. For this reason, we need to provide high consistency. Yeah. We have. Karanthir and Kashi, you kind of want them together. Because otherwise, Karanthir is a brick. And a Karanthir and Kashi usually does gets more value than a regular Kashi played from hand. It could be done with tutors, but Renfri decks lack efficient options, right? Uh, because Triss and Mata are low points. They're 9 for 6 or 9 for 7. Uh, 9 provisions for 7 points is not very good. So, instead of relying on tutors, we try to achieve perfect thinning. Seven cards stint from the deck guarantee that every card is found in round three. Let me pull up the deck while we're ahead. While we're ahead. Oops. My Kashi deck. Look, Ma, I'm famous. That way you can see the deck on the left while we... Uh... What? Um... Yeah, so deck thin seven. That's the secret reason behind running Iris plus companions. Not only carrier value is high in all units deck, but also one crucial thinning is provided. Yeah, and and that's why this was only possible in the February patch because that's when Mohan Riders went to four P, and I went from having you know five thinning before to having seven thinning because I got one more thinning from this, and that let me put Iris in because I knew that I was always going to get full value from everything and draw everything. Kashi, Larvas, and Thinning cards are perfect feed for Morntart. This card grants better spreadability and scaling. Yes. Morntart, before before Morntart, you had to win round one and then you wanted to go to round three with your Kashi and just try to like make sure it sticks. But with Morntart, it means that you can bleed with Kashi and still have a lot of juice left in round three with Morntart. Kashi will be used to push or defend the bleed, and Morntart remains as a short round win con. Flexible slots are used to provide deck with control tools. Riptide, Cyclops, and Doragary help to keep, keep greedy opponents' engines in check. Although it's often possible to play around this control. Yeah. Our control isn't the best, but it's like enough to... If somebody's playing something really greedy, that we can at least uh, deal with it. Like Militilly, for example. Control elements and Sir Scratch a lot help to contest long rounds, which are slight weaknesses of the deck. First turns are weak due to Kashi Adrenaline Restriction, and free Kashi uses peak performance in mid-length rounds around six cards. Long enough to set up Kashi, short enough to not let the opponent develop engine board before Kashi is deployed. And then another example is Masquerade Ball. This is the standard Masquerade Ball with Imposter and Amir. Sorry, Usurper and Amir uh, with Imposter Leader. He says... Oh, did he even mention me? No, but it's my deck. Aha. Only a part of the deck, Joachim plus Ku, Usurper plus uh, Rosa Edna, and Masker Ball scale decently into a short round. Masker Ball is a powerful card, especially in the long round, but it impacts spreadability in a negative way. When put under pressure, Masker Ball has to be committed with no tempo. Yeah, when you play a scenario like Masquerade Ball or um, like Siege, you get a four point card. Haunt is the same way, right? A lot of the old school scenarios like have a very low tempo on the first turn that you play it. So if opponent's bleeding you, and then you you decide that you're gonna need the scenario to play the scenario, or, or you get too old, you play scenario, and it's unlikely that with four tempo you get ahead, and so opponent can then just pass and haha, you trade your scenario for like whatever the last card was. You like overall prefers long rounds where all synergies uh, get probably developed. Also, imposter leader itself is great to seize initiative in a long round. Point slam is located in the high end. Uh, the first round to win should preferably be long. Otherwise, the deck would have to commit short round win condition cards. Right. Consequently, aristocrats have to identify 
if to contest round one deeply or pass early and get enough round two to defend the push wall. Yeah, this is a this is kind of a key thing. Um, if you fight for round one with a deck like Aristocrats, uh, Masquerade Ball, or Enslave Six, and you lose it, you're in a lot of trouble. If you don't fight for the round and you lose it, you're most likely very fine and are happy to see a bleed or or perfectly comfortable defending a bleed. But uh, having a long round to defend the push means that like you have more time to set up your Art Fane, um, and it would still be there for round three. Here's Inspired Zeal Demo Man Muta Generator. This was all over the place last uh, season. Points come from Muta Generator and Temple, combined with Enseus, as well as powerful threats King Demavan and Rapar's Vengeance. His deck plays loads of Vengeance, generally scales better into a long round. The main showdown trump is hand buffed Prince and Seis with Rat of a Judgment. Yeah. Consistency is a serious issue. Finding Temple and Mutant early is important. Demavan is the only tutor for these cards. That's why the deck runs Curse Scroll. The other slight weakness is limited control, but for Anseus, Um, But they do have a lot of like points. Like, these guys can't do like six damage in one turn, but over time, they start to be able to do that once you have them all on the board, right? But they do have run like one boiling oil. Um, the deck generally needs to build board first established. Yeah. So if they don't have first say, and you have like an engine deck that needs to be like stopped right right from, from the start, they have trouble against it. But they had trouble against my syndicate deck, for example. Skellige, PF Warriors. Points come from Tier, Fukushi, and Sov, supported by raids. Deck isn't perfectly spreadable when it comes to round one. It's mostly for carryover. Interacting with the opponent's board and contesting the round may be troublesome. Yeah. Whenever you see a Warriors player like trying to remove all your engines round one, like that's not usually a good thing for them. Against high tempo decks, losing on even from blue coin is a real threat. Like Madame played uh, round one. Like can make it so even like even if the the syndicate player passes at seven cards, they couldn't catch up even going to four. <laughs> Power is invested into two last rounds and deck scales very well into any round length. Sovintir provides strong practice plays while raids and care control bring efficient control. Symbiosis. Okay. So these are all the like meta decks. He does the same thing for all of them. So here's a summary. And I think uh, if any of you want a TLDR, this is the part that you want to pay attention to. These are Lirio's top secret Omega Giga foolproof how to get 2600 in, in one day deck building strategies. Number one, points first. Don't build decks where the win con cards do not match or exceed the meta power level. If your deck just simply doesn't have enough points, don't bother trying to make it consistent or defend the bleed or whatever because it's like uh, building a house out of Toxic sludge. Like, even if you make the one, if you design the prettiest thing and 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 are super thoughtful and build it at like below budget, it doesn't matter. You built the house from toxic sludge, no one's ever gonna live in it. It's not a good house. Right? Think of long and short rounds. Exact cards you like to play in order. Otherwise, this is something I'm gonna try and think about more. Four, seven, and ten. Uh, card rounds like my Golden Necker movement deck doesn't have a good four card round. I have a winning plan for more than one round. I've gone good, decent at this. Uh, decks relying on finding crucial places at the right time require extensive tutoring. So if you have a combo deck, then you need lots of tutors. If round one, round two, access to those cards is not that important and the number of outside round three cards is very low and they don't rely on each other, then tutors are likely of underwhelming value. This is why you never see a uh, Ren Free NG deck running um, a bunch of tutors. <laughs> or any tutors, really. Finally, some builds... And that's why, like, when you see Menno played in, like, uh, Soldier's uh, Iron Dite deck, you're just like, what? Why? Finally, some builds may try to achieve seven cards thinning, thinning to two cards of the neck, which guarantees access to all cards in round three. That's my Kashi deck. Cool. Well, I hope you found this useful. 
Um, six key aspects of deck building. Points, control, evasion, consistency, spreadability, and scaling. So look at your own decks and see if they fit those criteria. Cheers.